Brash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. If you do not come from a religious culture, a very strict religious culture, much of what you're going to hear over the next 90 minutes is going to seem like a joke, a lie, like we made it up, like nobody thinks like that. (laughs) And you're going to wonder, what planet did we come from? But I assure you, that what you're going to hear happens all over, at least the Bible Belt here in the Midwest. I know in any religious culture, everybody has its own, they have their own idiosyncrasies. And as I was reading the stories, I have enough in the email inbox to do four or five shows on the topic. It's called Harry Potter is of the Devil. And it plays to the fears that Many of us uh, were given by our authority figures, our parents, our pastors, our teachers, our Sunday school teachers, whatever. And they saw evil in everything. Now, granted, they didn't know a whole lot about the headlines themselves where evil may exist. And I'm not talking about evil as in evil spirits. I'm one of those guys who I use the word evil to define an action or a mindset. If I see genocide happen in my mind, that is evil. It is not uh, an evil spirit that makes it happen, but I use the word. Some people don't, but I do. I think there are some people who are evil people. They are continuously motivated by um, very, you know, very dark intentions. I don't prescribe any supernatural (laughs) uh, reasoning behind it, but I'm just saying I'm not afraid of the word. Okay. When I was growing up, evil was everywhere. You can't watch certain television shows because they're evil. You can't listen to certain music because it's evil. And people would just sort of grab these random things out of pop culture and then you know, hold seminars on it. They'd travel the country and hundreds, if not thousands, would attend as they were warned about the scourge of Satan and otherwise benign things. Our toys and our music television and movies they're all of satan and they'd get everybody frothing at the mouth and they'd go home and do something that most rational people would never otherwise do a great example is the music uh i remember i graduated high school in 1986 and um i was in junior high so what is that early 80s they br- i went to a, a private christian school right i was and and they were it was good people they were good people <laughs> they meant well, you know, sometimes the worst things are done with with the best of intentions. And they brought somebody in to warn us about evil, specifically in rock music. Now, contemporary Christian music was still a fledgling at the time. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with, with the phenomenon of CCM, contemporary Christian music is my background. I was a, a Christian broadcaster for 12 years, and we played... It's like an emulation of what is happening in pop radio and rock radio at the time. So it, what happened was is that the church decided it was a great tool and a great alternative to the worldly music out there. So they had Christian radio and guitars and drums and guitar solos and drum solos and you know. And honestly, the production values these days, because most of those Christian record labels are owned by large music corporations who smell a buck. And they know that it is very, very profitable. Many times you can't tell the difference between the production values of Christian music and pop music. I mean, it sounds really clean. But growing up especially, it was pretty rough. (laughs) It was pretty rough. And uh, they they wanted us to listen to the alternative. They wanted us to listen to good, wholesome, Jesus-oriented Christian music. Because 
Rock music was of the devil. They had people come in to tell us that the beat of the song was an emulation of some kind of a satanic drum beat. I, I don't even know where they got that. Uh, someone uh, invokes these African tribes that <laughs> that would call down the spirits and rock music emulates that same beat. And we, you know, we were minnows. We kids just sit there with our, with our eyes open. Really? Oh, man, it's evil. Oh, little did we know, rock albums weren't just bad for your frontwards. They were bad when you played them backwards. Now, for those of you under the age of 25, an album is a disc with grooves. <laughs> like, I know you know what an album is, but I always, when I say album, people are always like, an album? Man, he just dated himself. They were prevalent. Albums were everywhere, and people would play them backwards to listen for subliminal messages hidden in the grooves. And um, I, I brought some examples with me. Um, the, the most infamous one is probably from the Beatles' White Album. Uh, there's a portion of the album that says Revolution Number 9. It says Number 9, Number 9, Number 9. And when you play it backwards, it says something supposedly entirely different. Here's the cut. Number nine, 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 and the underman, and the underman, and the underman, and the underman, and the underman. Now, what it's saying is turn me on, dead man, according to the theologians and experts who all gathered us into a room. There was a guy on a television in the 80s. You can find this clip on YouTube. The, the audio recording is not great, but uh, let me make sure I get his name right because uh, we had a different guy. His name was, um, it'll, it'll come to me in just a second. Uh, he, it was a Christian TV station in Kansas City. And John Muncy did a, an entire show on the evils of backward masking. And he played a song by ELO called El Dorado. I'm sure you've heard of the song if you follow any kind of 70s rock music. Anyway, he does a clip. Here's an audio clip from that piece. Right. Let me play this song. This is uh, on the El Dorado album, the song called El Dorado. <laughs> Playing it forwards now. Here it is now. Same thing backwards. Uh, he is the nasty one, Christ your inferno. And though it is said we're dead men, everyone that does have the mark on him lives. He is the nasty one, Christ. You're infernal. And it follows with the phrase, everyone who has the mark will live. Well, come on. <laughs> but we were kids, and it's scary when you play that stuff backwards anyway. When you're a child and you hear it and you're programmed to receive these messages as satanic, it freaked us out. We all had goosebumps. We were and got the chills. Jeez, it's Satan. It's the message of the devil. There's a whole litany of examples out there. Stairway to Heaven, Led Zeppelin, al allegedly contained passages of satanic stream of consciousness stuff. Stuff like, happy is the man who makes me sad, whose power is Satan. Uh, a Child is Coming by uh, Starship, Jefferson Starship. Uh, apparently, it, it has Son of Satan over and over and over when played backwards. Queen's another one, Bites the Dust. You play it backwards, it says, start to smoke marijuana. <laughs> Sticks, snow blind, Satan move through our voices. <sighs> Black Oak, Arkansas. When electricity came to Arkansas, play it backwards, it allegedly said, Satan, 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 he is God. He is God. He is God. When you play it backwards, it's evil. We were programmed. 
So, you know, the, the next thing we did when we got brave enough is we got copies of the albums, went home, played them all backwards. Well, you know, the great way to ruin a stylus on a record player, <laughs> play everything backwards. <laughs> Michael Shermer has a great bit. He did a speech at uh, TED about patternicity, about uh, how we seek out patterns. And uh, he, he played series of uh, different songs with supposed backward masking in it, and no one knew what it said. But then he pasted the words up on the screen, and you could hear it immediately. You know, you oh, now I know what to listen for now. I know it's evil. It's intentional. This could not have happened by accident. And there was a whole litany of these songs. And, and, the, and the parents and the teachers and the pastors went crazy. You should have seen them. They'd encourage you to bring your albums, your rock albums, to church. They'd put them in a big pile, and they would burn them. Just burn them down. We've got a story coming up here, if I get to it, about uh, someone who burned a Harry Potter book. <laughs> and something weird happened. This is, I mean, what rational person would, would do that? It's amazing what religion makes you do. Anyway... Thank you so much to everyone for the calls and the emails. I see my switchboard right now is absolutely jam-packed. I promise you I'm going to get to as many of these as I possibly can over the next 90 minutes. Rick sent me an email. He said, when I was in high school back in the 70s, my father was a fundamentalist, Calvinist minister with an interest in the occult, which has a rich history in rural Vermont where I grew up. As a teenager, I was into music and brought home a copy of Black Sabbath's self-titled record, the one with the witch-looking person standing in the woods on the cover. As my father confiscated the record from me and burned it in the fireplace, he explained in all seriousness it was dangerous for me to have that record because each copy had a demon with it. In fact, he said he'd heard that the original photo used on the cover did not have the image of the witch in it. The witch only appeared as each copy was duplicated. That witch was the image of my personal demon. As I listened to the music, I was allowing that demon to enter me, a nefarious plot by the forces of Satan. What makes this memorable to me is that my father really, really believed, and he was terrified. For him, the exorcism might as well have been a documentary. That story sums up my childhood experience. Gidget sent me a letter and said, I grew up a Church of God in Christ-centered home. My mother at the time was an evangelist missionary. Had a war on anything and everything not in the Bible. Of course, Harry Potter was on the do not read list, as well as Casper the Friendly Ghost. But the Holy Ghost was okay. Uh, Pokemon, Charmed, and other popular shows, books, etc. At the time, I knew it wasn't real. Now, mind you, before my parents' divorce in 95, the crazy God talk boiled down to me not being allowed to have the batteries. Not being allowed to have the batteries inside my Teddy Ruxpin bear. <laughs> because it was saying subliminal evil messages. I can't wait to hear your story. Let's go to the switchboard and start with area code 270. Hi, you're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. What's your name? Uh, DJ. DJ, I'm so glad you're part of the show. You have an evil that you were warned about as you grew up or in your culture? For four years, even though I was a Catholic, I, they sent, my parents sent me to a fundamentalist uh, school. And what I discovered there was uh, not openly were, both, were people like uh, Voltaire, um, who wrote my favorite book, by the way, uh, Candide. Um, Voltaire, um, uh, Emerson, Thoreau, uh, they were banned. But also, even many books that you know would otherwise be considered Christian or religious, or even television, for that matter, be um, be, be um, uh, we were warned about as being dangerous. Uh, probably the best example of this was a was a book called The Robe. I don't know if you're familiar with that. The Robe is a book, and it was turned into a movie in the 1950s with Richard Burton. It's a very Christian movie. I can't really see You wouldn't necessarily think there was anything wrong with that. But it was considered evil, of all things, because of the person who um, wrote it was a liberal minister. 
we generally weren't even allowed to listen to music. We were explicitly banned to listen to music with instruments. That was another bad thing, even if it was religious music. Were you guys Church of Christ or what? Yeah, there was a Church of Christ school. I never understood that. You know, if you read the scriptures, you know, it's like praise him with the trumpet, praise him with all these instruments, and yet you go to a Church of Christ church, and they don't want any instruments in the Sunday services. I never understood that. It's something I've never quite understood myself, but yeah. uh, it's something that I eventually was able to get off of. My friend, I'm glad you escaped the evil and managed to set yourself free. Thanks for the call. Mm-hmm. Area code 919. Thank you for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. What's your name? My name is Crystal. Hi, Crystal. Thanks for uh, for calling the show. All yeah, right. your show is awesome. You have been accosted in your life by evil, by the, by the Beelzebub himself. What happened to you? Well, I have a story about someone who was actually one of my best friends, but uh, we're not anymore because he got crazy religious, basically. <laughs> and so he uh, lives with his girlfriend and um, her kids, and in the last 14 months he said that he changed and that Christ like spoke to him and all these things and um he said that he took all symbols of the devil out of his girlfriend's house like for their kids and he said that Pokemon was a symbol of the devil and that uh Disney was evil and so all the symbols like that reminded him or that he thought were from the devil like he went through the house and took them out <laughs> Subjectively, he just decided what was influenced by Satan and just tossed it? Well, his interpretation, he has this whole other interpretation of the Bible, which he thinks is the correct version, which I've never really heard of. So he took all these things out of the house, which he said were from the devil. And what was her reaction? I'm not really sure. I never really got to know her that well. But it was sad because we were actually really good friends, but he just was really discriminating against me, so we're not even friends anymore. I, I can think of a few people I know who just went so crazy. Uh, a friend of mine calls him Cray Cray. Wow, <laughs> that's exactly that him. He said in the last 14 months he just suddenly changed and that he studied the Bible and he had these mystical experiences of, of uh, he said a demon talked to him, and I didn't believe him, and then he got really mad at me for not believing him, and the, the friendship ended, and we were having all these arguments on Facebook about it. Yeah. Yeah, that's cray-cray, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so basically his things from the devil are Pokemon um, and Disney. Well, thanks for sharing, and uh, appreciate you listening to the show. Thank you for the kind words. Thank you so much. Your show is awesome. Keep it up. Thank you so much for calling. I had Denise send a message. She said, my mother thought breastfeeding was evil. Breastfeeding? She said, if God wanted women to breastfeed, he wouldn't have created bottles. You hear that long pause? (laughs) Because there's nothing to say. Uh, Nikki in Canada said, when I was 12, I babysat some kids and they were told Barbie, the Barbie doll, was evil because she didn't wear underwear. You know, I used to think that. Oh, yeah. Barbie's a naughty girl. Even glimpsing at her without clothes on was a sin due to lustful thoughts. Their mom made us use permanent markers and paint to draw underwear on before we were allowed to play with any Barbie dolls. Here's another one that Nikki brought up that I had not heard. And I, and I, um, I talked to a friend of mine and she said, Oh yeah, I've heard that one. I've heard that one. She said, my cousin was told that the off broadcast color bars on the TV were the devil's way of getting into your home. Now, I realize we live in the era of 24-hour television, but it used to be that at the end of the broadcast day, they would play this, often here in America, they would play some really cheese ball sign-off at, you know, two or three in the morning. And they had four major channels, and, and I'm sure they have the, the broadcast bars on on cable whenever they need to, but but uh, they'd have this thing come on, usually with an American flag, and they would play for 30 seconds, and they would sign off. If you've seen the movie Poltergeist... With a little girl in front of the television, you know exactly what it's like when a TV station signs off. And then they'd put these color bars, these broadcast bars, up on the television. And uh, apparently there's this whole culture of people who believe that those color bars are a conduit between Earth and the spirit world. So that Satan could crawl through 
Get into your house. That is way jacked up. Area code 214. Thank you so much for waiting. You are on the Thinking Atheist podcast. What's your name? I think um, I think Aaron Ross. Aaron Raw, <laughs> my hero and mentor. Dude, I'm so, I, I, I was hoping you were listening tonight. I, for those who were who were wondering, Aaron and I are, are, are friends, and, and I dropped him a line and said, hey, I, I can't Skype. We we're going to talk about some stuff for the Reason Rally. And, and then I said, I can't, I can't really talk. I'm doing a podcast. So I shot him the link, and lo and behold. Now, I know you were into some pretty wild stuff growing up, Aaron, but can you speak to this whole people reading evil into every benign thing on planet Earth? You got something specific? Oh, yeah, well, hey, I played Dungeons & Dragons. You got, well, that's you got evil, a high-level character in Dungeons & Dragons that indoctrinated you into witchcraft. They warned us about it when we were in school, something about the role-playing nature of it and the dice were evil and people would have these parties and be up all night. And they they had us scared to death of D&D. And looking back, at it, I just feel so dumb. They were dumb, using the five you know? elements Jeez. of witchcraft. Remember the, the Pythagorean solids? Those were represents five elements of witchcraft right there. I don't, I've never played the game. I'm not familiar with the game, but I hear echoes of what we heard back in the uh, the 80s about D&D uh, with a game called Magic. Are you familiar with it? Magic the Gathering? That's the wussy game for modern <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that wasn't for guys like us back in the day. I'm amazed at how much real evil was ignored in favor of... Do you, I mean, do you remember the big Procter & Gamble scare in the 80s? Oh, yes. Um, when when the the symbol the logo that was that was supposed to look vaguely like a horse is supposed to have a six 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 in it, and I remember all the protests led by surprise surprise Pat frickin' Robertson. And you talk about the evil that was overlooked. I mean, we I don't want to get on to Pat Robertson. I'm going to let that go for a moment. We'll 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 deal with him another time. Yeah, because you could do a whole show on him. Was it Robertson? Was the one who said nine eleven was was God's punishment? Uh, for allowing homosexuality in America. I mean, I, and in 1994, he urged his 30,000 some odd followers to go out and kill homosexuals where to find them. Really? Yes. He said the words. Yes, and he he meant that you if you kill homosexuals, you will earthquakes. The reason that the San Francisco earthquake that had just happened prior, or Malibu, one or the other, the reason that the damage in Malibu was so much worse than a hurricane that hit someplace like in Haiti was because it, it wasn't because every square inch of Malibu was more expensive than the entire island of Haiti. It was because God was visiting his vengeance on the United States because the United States was the only country, according to Pat Robertson, that allowed homosexuals to live. Meanwhile, we're playing records backwards. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, we're throwing away our Pokemon toys. You got to be kidding me! By the way, Arn Raw is my full time guest for next Tuesday's show, and I, I mentioned, I, and I know you have it on your calendar, but this is a verbal reminder that that uh, next Tuesday night, Arn and I are, we're going to talk in depth about the Reason Rally. We're going to talk about what he's been doing with the Magic Sandwich Show. We're going to talk about what he's been doing in Texas. We'll probably, you know, make fun of Rick Perry. I know he's not running, but oh, he's not running for you. I he's coming back. <laughs> you got him as governor. <laughs> but uh, I look forward to a chance to sit down when I don't have a, an a uber full switchboard and just talk about kind of the state of the craziness of the world and see what's happening in your world. By the way, uh, check out his YouTube page, A-R-O-N-R-A, Aaron Raw. Man, thanks for calling the show. It was good to talk to you. Talk to you later, man. Take it easy. All right, let me go in depth on this Procter & Gamble thing real fast. For, for those who have no idea what I'm talking about, and this is a symptom of a larger problem. OK, and because we are trained in the faith to see evil everywhere and to not do our own homework, right? We take the word of our spiritual leaders, our pastors, our teachers, our parents, right? So if somebody says something is evil, we just knee jerk and automatically there are major consequences. Well, Procter & Gamble had a logo. It was, um, it was actually originated in the mid-1800s. It was this crude cross uh, that, that barge workers painted on cases of Procter & Gamble star candles. And, and it was just to identify them. People back then were not all that literate. They, they used pictures more than, uh, than text as identifying symbols on the crates on the dock so they could see what they were. Procter & Gamble later changed this symbol into a trademark. It was a man, a half-moon man, overlooking 13 stars. Now, 
<laughs> you got a moon, you got stars, you got the number 13. That's a recipe for evil. So people made the leap from this to Satanism. There was this urban legend that the Donahue show, which was like um, an Oprah for in the 80s, right? Um, it was one of those talk talking head shows where he'd have a guest and he'd wander around into the to, into the audience with mics. There was this rumor, totally unsubstantiated, that on the Donahue show, the CEO or president or whoever, Procter & Gamble, came out and said he was a Satanist and the profits from Procter & Gamble went to support the Church of Satan. Now, did the sheeple take enough time to do any homework and find out? Of course not. They threw all of their Procter & Gamble stuff out, and Procter & Gamble made a bunch of stuff. I remember I had relatives who, who brought, uh, like, detergent. Well, Procter & Gamble pff, just tossed it out, refused to buy it, refused to buy it. We're talking about an, an altering of a lifestyle, because if you buy it, you are supporting the Church of Satan. People also said if you held the Procter & Gamble logo up in front of a mirror— you could see the mark of the beast, the 666, in the swirls of the man in the moon's beard. Or if you connected the stars correctly with these curving strokes, oh, you know it makes a 666. There was a small group of people that said the logo proved the company was owned by the Moonies. You cannot make this stuff up. At one point, Procter & Gamble was getting 15,000 phone calls a month in the early 80s from people who were freaked out that they were serving the church of Satan. <sighs> they actually had to change the logo. They discontinued the moon and stars in 1985 just to shut everybody up. And there's still people who won't buy Procter & Gamble. You want to know why? Because somebody told them that it's evil. Area code 801, thanks for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? Brandon. Thank you for calling the show. What do you have for us? When I was little, my mother always told me that everything was full music that I listened to, rock music, video games, comic books was just made by Satan. <laughs> it was just the Satan trying to grab my soul and take it from the church and Jesus. When did you finally figure out that you, number one, weren't going to hell, and two, you weren't opening a portal uh, to hell so that Satan could control <laughs> control you? I mean, when did you figure it out? <laughs> My friend, he he, he's, he was an atheist. He is an atheist. I recently became an atheist about a year ago. And he just told me about it, and little by little, I started questioning my pastor, my mother, <laughs> about just simple things about why does this do this and why does everything have to deal with Satan. Like Aaron Ross said a couple of minutes ago, I used to play Magic the Gathering with my friend. And when she found my cards, she just made me burn them. She said that Satan had my soul now, and she forced me to pray with her. And Wow. Called, she called the pastor. The pastor's wife, the pastor, they gathered around and just prayed for my soul and I've got a D and D story coming up that'll probably resonate with you, and uh, so so hang on for that. Thanks for calling the show. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Never guess this. I got a letter from Amanda. She said, "Apparently, my red hair is of the devil." <sighs> Who are these people? You know, some people should require a license to procreate. You should, you should have to pass a test. <laughs> what red hair? <sighs> My Pentecostal holiness aunt and uncle told my mother when I was five or six that she should cover my hair because their preacher said redheads had the mark of Satan. They continued the idea by talking about how Cain was a redhead. You mean like Cain and Abel in the book of Genesis? <laughs> and that Eve went from blonde to redhead after the fall. She eats the fruit. She's blonde. She becomes a redhead. Oh, that's evil. Later, I found out only redheaded females had to cover their hair. The men were okay to have red hair without any modesty. Aha. Uh -huh. Unbelievable. Aaron said, my father's a Southern Baptist preacher. 
My mother is the perfect preacher's wife. Growing up in this household, they carefully maintained an aura of delusion for my brother and I that took many years for me to throw asunder. The term worldly is considered equilaterally tangent to evil in there in many fundamentalist contexts. I remember a young child. I was a young child at the age of three or four. I was being sat down for a craft project. And I was told to cut out all of the, quote, bad and worldly pictures from a stack of magazines. These included anything from cigarettes and booze to people with limited clothes and whatnot. At the time, I didn't think anything of it. Looking back now with my own two children, I can't imagine forcing them to something like this. I, not only am I exposing them to unnecessary adult advertising, but they wouldn't even understand why any of this was bad. He continues, moving forward a few years, and in the early 90s, Pumsy the Dragon was introduced in schools. I was in fourth grade when it came to our area. My father flipped out on the school, on the school board, on the county commission, he even went and spoke to the state senate in Texas. There were, of course, the ever-popular evils that evolved, including Care Bears, Garbage Pale Kids, Harry Potter, Dragon Tales... Dungeons and Dragons, anything with monsters and ghosts, pretty much any secular worldly music at all. I even had a white Christian rapper CD back when Vanilla Ice was popular as proof that godly alternatives were available. So I grew up thinking anything that was outside of the church, part of pop culture, was pretty much easily considered evil. I've got a uh, Skype call on the board. It says 111. Who's this? Hey, it's Shane uh, from Ireland. Shane, thanks for calling. You have an example for us? Yeah, what happened is there's a really uh, innocent show about like three priests living in rural Ireland. And um, after a few seasons, like one of the episodes, one of the priests admitted to being an atheist, but it was taken way too seriously over here, I think. The entire show was just kind of making fun of Christianity to begin with, but... As soon as one of the priests admitted to being an atheist, it became all serious all of a sudden. Like, uh, you had one priest that was extremely smoker, one that was just a complete idiot, and one who pretty much just drank all day and couldn't say anything else but drink. What's the name of the show again? Oh, sorry, it's uh, Father Ted. Father Ted. I wonder if I can find some clips online. I posted a few um, links on the forum chat. I'll check it out online. I'll look around for that. All right. Thanks. Take care of yourself. Jessica said, you may or may not have read the book Satanism, The Seduction of Mer America's Youth, written by Christian talk show host Bob Larson. That's the guy. Bob Larson's who I was thinking of. Uh, I've been reading uh, through it for the laughs. <laughs> and he talks, this is totally true, by the way. Jessica's dead on. He, he talks about the dangers of Satanism and how he's helped guide many a youth gone astray. For example, teenagers who listen to Slayer and youth who participate in ghoulish games like D&D. Even told a 12-year-old boy that because he played Bloody Mary, he'd invited the devil into his life. This man should be prosecuted for psychologically abusing an entire generation. Now, this was published in 1989. It leads me to believe that there was a massive hysteria around this time about Satanism. You would be correct, Jessica. Mr. Larson frequently references murders and suicides as being caused by bands, like rock bands or games. Even though I find the idea of Satanism humorous, I have real concerns about how the religious view it. They think it's real. They think the devil has power. It concerns me. Instead of looking at the reality of a problem, they think a good cure is church or prayer. Bob Larson even compiled a horrifying list of signs your child is dangerously involved with the devil. There's eight on this list. Let me just read them, and uh, you tell me if your child is possessed by the devil. Number one, your child's grades drop dramatically. Two, isolation, aggression, and anger. Three, a wider circle of friends is exchanged for a select group belonging to the developing coven. Coven? Four, sports and extra extracurricular activities are avoided. Oh, he, he doesn't want to play football, honey. He must be in league with Lucifer. <laughs> Suicidal thoughts are often expressed or written down in distorted poetic forms. Six, secret agendas are established, often involving unexplained activities during late night hours. You want to know why teens are running around late at night? It's because they're freaking teens. Seven, 
Self-mutilation is practiced and a calendar of regular rituals is scheduled. 8. Available time is spent devoted to satanic literature, often borrowed from a local library, books like the Necronomicon and the Satanic Bible. After this list, he says your child could be doing these things because they are bored. Quote, an idle mind is the devil's playground. Area code 661. Hi, you're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Thanks for your patience. Who's this? Hi, Seth. Uh, love this show. I've uh, been listening for a while now. My name is Steven. Hi, Stephen. Thanks for calling. What do you got for us? Awesome. So I grew up in a Pentecostal environment. It was part Assemblies of God, part Word of Faith. Um, you know, it's the kind of thing you see on TV evangelism. And I can't tell you how many nights I lost sleep thinking about demons and evil spirits trying to get me. And, was, you know, I've left Christianity. I've reflected on that a lot and just how insidious it is to imprint those fears on the minds of young children. And it's like... These fundamentalist religions first tell you that there are these horrible, evil spirits in the world. And then, you know, they're like, oh, but, but we have a cure here. And once you're good and terrified, they're like, we have the cure. Uh, we can protect you so long as you believe in these things that we've taught you. And it's like they stick you with an infection, and then they dangle the cure in front of your face. And it's horrible, but it's like such a great way to make sure that kids are indoctrinated and uh, that they won't stray. I mean, the first time I ever dressed up for Halloween uh, was this – past year you know I, I was a dark wizard if i'm going to be a damn apostate i'm going to be a good damn apostate <laughs> so in any case uh, you mentioned bob larson but there was this other uh I mean, during the whole 90s it was crazy for uh, young christians uh there was this music video by a guy named carmen called witch's invitation and uh he had another one called uh, no monsters in my house but uh this witch's invitation one i remember it's the cheesiest thing in the world but it freaked me the hell when i was a kid and it was just like, you know, he goes over to this witch's house and the sorcerer is trying to, uh, trying to show him how powerful he is compared to his god. And it's just ridiculous. There is also um, a lot of things that they just told us were demonic and evil. And the thing that comes to my mind is uh, the Ouija boards that Parker oh. Brothers put out when I was a kid. Like, this was in the 90s for me. And I remember seeing the commercial. My whole family was like, oh, this is so evil, this is so demonic. And now I'm thinking about it, and I'm like, wait a minute. So Parker Brothers manages to harness all the mystical powers of these dangerous, <laughs> evil, supernatural beings. And the best thing they can think to do with them is have them, like, move a little triangle across the board and not, like, you know, attack Milton Bradley headquarters or, uh, you know, go after uh, Nintendo so kids will play more board games. Let's do anything practical. Let's just have the demons move the triangle on the board. Everybody check uh, Parker Brothers' symbol, see if it's got a moon and some stars and some stuff on it because, you know... If Obviously, they're agents of the Church of Satan. Yeah. Well, when I was growing up, we were we were terrified of the Ouija board. We really felt like that we had heard stories that the people who would have parties with friends they'd stay up late and they would and and there were always stories of someone who said, "I felt it move. I didn't move it. It moved itself. It moved itself. There was a spirit in the room. It was the scariest thing I've ever done." And then the warning they gave to us as children is, "Once you do that, once you've opened the door, now you have essentially." You've given permission for the demons and for Satan and his 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 angels, his agents, to to sort of taint you. I mean, you carry that stuff with you for the rest of your life, and it's just terrified us. It's terrifying. Uh, before I go, I'm going to let you get to your other uh, your other callers. But uh, the first thing that there's two things you need to check out. The first is uh, Chick Tracks. I don't know if you've ever seen Chick Tracks. Oh yeah. They're like these little comic strips that this guy named Dak Chick puts out, and one of them is called Dark Dungeons, and it tells about all the evils of uh, playing Dungeons and Dragons. And, you know, it's really, really hilarious. Stupid, but hilarious. And the second thing is uh, on YouTube, there was this uh, documentary that was produced by a Christian company in uh, the late 80s called Turmoil in the Toy Box. And it's basically this uh, Christian documentary uh, about why everything that kids enjoyed in the 80s was evil and a tool of Satan. It's crazy. All right. Thanks for the call very much. Thank, thank you, Seth. Keep up the good work. I remember the uh, the chick tracks. I feel like I'm I'm having to give a like a backstory on every icon, every topic that comes up. But I realize there are those who have no idea what some of this stuff is. So bear with me. In the 70s and 80s, there were these, and I believe they're still available. You can just Google chick like like a chick tracks, and they were like little comic books about the size of a little bit smaller than a checkbook. Okay. And each one had a short form story about how someone needed God and they were saved. 
I remember one was about this really gnarly truck driver, foul mouthed, hard drinking, hard living guy, and something happened. I don't remember what exactly. And at the end, he has he accepts Jesus. And every one of these chick tracks is what they were called. These little comics had a different story and they were everywhere. They they'd hand them out on Halloween. Instead of candy, religious people would throw those in people's candy bags and just piss them off. <laughs> you know, uh, I, but, I mean, they were, they were everywhere, everywhere. And then there were all sorts of little tricks like that. Like they had some tracks. I don't know if chick did these, but they look like a $20 bill folded in half and they'd lay them on the ground. And you pick it up and it says something along the lines of, hey, have you repented and accepted Jesus as your savior? So you have thought you were found a 20 on the ground. You pick it up and it's the message of salvation. It's supposed to be sort of a covert way for the Holy Spirit to guide you toward that 20 on the sidewalk so that you can grab it and pick it up. And you'll read those two sentences and realize you have been sinful in your ways and you must accept the Lord to have eternal life in heaven with him. Speaking of chick, I saw this on their website. They were promoting a DVD called Harry Potter Witchcraft Repackaged. Let me back up before I, I talk about the DVD, because if we're going to title the show Harry Potter is of the Devil, we need to talk about Harry Potter. According to one of my favorite websites, ChristianAnswers.net, children are understandably fascinated with the kind of power that Harry and others in his world possess. Author J.K. Rowling says... The idea that we could have a child who escapes from the confines of the adult world and goes somewhere where he has power, both literally and metaphorically, really appealed to me, unquote. And Christian Answers responds, certainly power is appealing, especially, quote, white witchcraft like this that is made to look so innocent. Even some Christian leaders agree that it's just fantasy generally acceptable for the Christian reader, including Chuck Colson. The editors of World Magazine and Connie Neal, author of What's a Christian to Do with Harry Potter. However, Christian Answers continues. Occult experts, Marcia Montenegro of Christian Answers for the New Age and Carol Matresiana, forgive me, author of Gods of the New Age, disagree. Both have personal experience in the occult. God is clear that in Scripture, any practice of magic is, quote, an abomination to him. God doesn't distinguish between white and dark magic, since they both originate from the same source. Deuteronomy chapter 18 says, There shall not be found among you anyone who practices witchcraft or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you will dispossess listen to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. And they recommend oh, a, a, a DVD package. And I believe it is on Chick. Online, Harry Potter Witchcraft Repackaged. It's a movie that studies elements of Rowling's imagery and writings, including use of the Potter name in pagan religion, shape changing, meditation, human sacrifice, feminine power, feminine power, <laughs> Wicca. The tools, spells, and curses used in witchcraft, Christian youth and their involvement, communicating with the spirit world, reincarnation, situational ethics and witchcraft, the lightning bolt as a power symbol, broomsticks and witches' hats as phallic symbols, dabbling in divination and sorcery, recruitment, teaching children the dark arts. They even blame Scholastic Inc., for, for being a, a part of this conspiracy to co-opt an entire culture, an entire generation of children into witchcraft. At Chick Publications, the DVD description says millions of American school children have a new subject in school, sorcery. You cannot make this stuff up. One more real fast before I go back to the phones. Did you know that the Ninja Turtles... The teenage mutant ninja turtles were evil. <laughs> I mean, 
<laughs> you know, I just you just look around and you think these people vote. These people influence policy. These people influence what the curriculums are in schools. They duplicate their own fears and superstitious thinking and craziness on generations. They're afraid of the teenage mutant ninja turtles. There was an evangelist, and I, I sought his name. I tried to find out who it was. There was this YouTube clip that has been circulating, and I couldn't find out who this guy is, but it's it's old. <laughs> it's like a 20-year-old clip, okay? And he is warning about the Ninja Turtles. And they actually took a bunch of these, and I think they destroyed the toys. But I have an audio clip from that segment. The truth of the matter is, all kinds of children's cartoons incorporate ideals that are contrary to Christian beliefs. As we began to look into the toys of today, and the cartoons of today, and the video games of today, we began to realize something. Our children are being evangelized with another gospel. A gospel of outright Hinduism, occultism, humanism. Uh, the first thing I noticed looking at the table is the abundance of these uh, teenage mutant ninja turtle fellas. Their hero or their guru, who is a rat named Splinter, you heard it here first, folks. A rat named Splinter is the hero of this cartoon. This is one of the uh, the villains of the Mutant Ninja Turtles. Now, remember, folks, when we say villains, uh, the the hero uh, is using white magic or Eastern mystic uh, good powers, such as Star Wars taught us, the good side of the force, and the bad guys are using the bad powers, the black side of the force. But they're the it's, same powers. Yes, yeah, the same powers exactly. When you look at it from a biblical viewpoint, it's uh, white and black magic, which is a fallacy, as we uh, all know right here. Forgive me for the quality of the recording. It was taken apparently off an old VHS videotape, and it definitely shows. And people, people were freaked out about the stupidest stuff. Jewel sent a message and said, I couldn't wear shorts, ever. <laughs> they were considered provocative and not Christian. I wasn't allowed to listen to the radio either. I remember we were in Christian school. We, we used to go to play basketball games. You know, your high school plays ball, right? We used to go to these ball games. And we played a Christian school in our conference that was even more conservative than we were. They were way conservative as a Church of Christ school. So they come out, they, they come out with their cheerleaders. And I kid you not, their cheerleaders had skirts that touched the floor. So they're out there going, we've got spirit. Yes, we do. We've got spirit. How about you? <laughs> Meanwhile, they all, they look like they're going to prom. <laughs> Jeans weren't allowed at our school, except on Fridays. And I mean, for the girls. No, girls couldn't wear jeans. The guys, it was fine. Ah, guys can wear jeans anytime. Girls, no, except on Fridays. Why, we ask. Well, Jeans are what? A little can be a little too provocative. Hello? Look, let's just say that let's just go down that little bunny trail. <laughs> Anything can be form fitting and provocative. There what what is it about denim that con it's a conduit for the devil <laughs> that causes men to have lust in their heart. And I'm gonna tell you a story about lust in just a second that you will not believe. Let me let me warn you, if there are children in the room, this is really an adults-only story, okay? I mean, I realize some people listen with their families around. Trust me, you, you don't want your kids asking you about this. <laughs> but in just a second, I will share the story, and you are going to scratch your head. But first, I need to go back and get some callers on who've been so patient with me. Area code 951. Thank you for uh, waiting. Who's this? This is Corey Dotson. So glad you called. Do you have an experience with evil? Oh, I have many. <laughs> but I'll only tell you a few because, you know, you only have so much time. I'm 19 years old. Uh, I was born in 92. And my family went to a Pentecostal church. And, you know, they had the whole standards thing and all that craziness. And uh, anyways, this church was filled with wackos, okay? I, w I was reading Harry Potter one night, and this is when it was getting really popular. I think it was the late 90s. I was reading The Chamber of Secrets, and my mom came in there and tore the book out of my hands and told me it was of the devil. And I was like, no way. And I go, to, I went to Sunday school, and then they had a big lesson on it about how Harry Potter was of the devil. And I was like, oh, my God, are you serious? 
and they told us and how the how the spells in Harry Potter are actual spells that witches use. And I'm like, what? No way. And I, I was freaked out because I was reading the book and I was praying to God. I was like, God, please don't send me to hell. Wow. And uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it was wacky. And you know, I used to get in arguments with kids because you know I was good church boy. Pokemon. Pokemon was another thing that I had to throw all my Pokemon cards away because they were pocket monsters, monsters of the devil. And uh, that was the reasoning, by the way. I got to move on. Thank you for the call, though, very, very much. I appreciate it. You bring back some memories for me, man. Um, Rick said, it was the mid-1980s, I was about 13 years old, when the Christian right started its campaign against the game Dungeons & Dragons. You see a pattern? This, This thing was hugely warned against in the 80s especially. I'd been playing D&D for a few years by that point, Rick says. I didn't even think there was anything wrong with the game. My friends and I played warriors and wizards and elves and so on. Every week we vanquished the dragons, orcs, and sure, the occasional demon or two, but that's what they were for. They were evil villains to be destroyed. They were monsters. I enjoyed, mostly I enjoyed playing the dungeon master, the person in control of the game. Now, he goes on to explain that his mom had a big Jesus experience. It's too long for me to cover, but let me skip down. He says, I, it didn't take long for her to start dragging me to one of her born-again churches where the pastor jumped up and down, spoke in tongues, preached fire and brimstone, and slapped people on the forehead to cast out demons and heal them. At first, I didn't know what to make of all of it, but it was important to my mom, so I kept going. Rick continues, then the crazy really started. She decided, decided that all the problems in our family mostly that she couldn't get along with her loser husband and they were constantly fighting. All the problems in our family were being caused by the demonic game I was playing after school with my friends. So one day when I came home from school, she gathered up all of my D&D books, put them in a wheelbarrow, tossed on some lighter fluid and set flame to them, all while chanting, praise Jesus and we cast you out. Demons, like an idiot. Rick continues, I was, of course, forbidden to play the game anymore. That didn't really stop me. I just went to my friend's houses to play. I was understandably mad at her. I'd spent my own money on those books, which at the time were worth hundreds of dollars. Today would be worth thousands or more to collectors. I had some of the original first edition books. Rick, you're killing me. (laughs) What really made me mad is that she made this decision based on what she'd heard from other people. She'd seen the various news reports on TV about Dungeons and Dragons possibly being linked to teen suicide. Religious leaders like Pat Roberts and Jerry Falwell were speaking out against it. And of course, her pastor had preached about the dangers in church. All she needed to know was their D&D was evil, plain and simple. I suggested she sit in. Sit in on one of our game sessions so she could see how we played. To us, D&D was nothing more than fictional characters running around in caves, slicing up goblins. You roll a few dice, you pick a few locks, you load up on gold, you move on to the next map. Hey, we're 13! The storylines were kind of thin. We didn't try to use the game to channel demons, contact Satan, or any of that other baloney that the religious nuts were warning parents about. She refused. She refused to watch us play. She'd made up her mind. Rather than investigating the matter for herself and gaining first-hand knowledge to see how it worked, she put her blind faith in her religious leaders and what she'd seen on TV. Rather than listen to her own son and actually be bothered to take the time to see what I was doing, she unilaterally decided what was best for me because of what her pastor said was right. After all, God doesn't want us to have anything to do with demons. Area code 979. Thanks for your patience. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? This is Victoria. Thank you so much for waiting. Uh, you've been on hold for like 45 minutes. I appreciate your patience, Victoria. No so were you ever warned of evil, and what was it? Of course. I'm still traumatized, Seth. I, had, I was about 11 years old, and my mom took away every single one of my Care Bears <laughs> <laughs> after a church sermon. All right, explain why Care Bears are bad, would you? Well, they had magic power from their stomachs, and God is the only one that's supposed to have power, so she took away all of my Care Bears, all of my trolls. It was really sad. Your memory is that she went in, kind of took something that was precious to you for a really ridiculous reason. 
And and now you look back and you kind of resent the whole thing, don't you? Of course. And she lets my nieces play with Care Bears now. And meanwhile, real evil happens on the headlines every day. And people are like, ah, you know, whatever. Pass the salt. Thanks for calling the show very much. I appreciate Thank it. You. I mean, you think about the culture we live in. And people just say, well, for example, if you go into a skyscraper and you look at the elevator buttons, 10, 11, 12, 14, 15... Because the number 13 is evil. Well, everybody knows that the 14th floor is really the 13th floor. <laughs> we, it's the 13th floor. I don't care what you call it. If you're standing on the outside of the building, one, two, three, four, five, all the way up, it's 13. But somebody was so superstitious that they created such a fervor that now when they build skyscrapers, often they just skip over it. 11, 12, 14. I have a receipt right here. I actually brought it for the show. I'm going to put this on my Facebook page. Just something stupid. I went. We have a, an ice cream chain here in the Midwest called Brahms. Love it. Love it. Love it. And the receipt number in large letters at the top of the receipt was, you guessed it, 666. Well, the first thing, it was a joke. Everybody I was with was like, oh, 666. I mean, that's the first. We, we were all laughing about it. But I grew up in a culture where 666 was the number of the beast. There were people who wouldn't stay in a hotel room that was 666, or the hotel wouldn't number the room 666. Or in any other context, they wouldn't allow that number to come up. Or if they did see it, they'd run the other way. I've seen people, I kid you not, who purchased something over the counter and the total came to $6.66 and they bought a pack of gum to make the total something else. How jacked up is this world? If you have kids nearby, you might want to just send them on vacation for just a second. And just just go, go play with your toys. <laughs> But I got to tell you this story, okay? And and I I heard the story last year from a friend who went to this church, and he told me what prompted him to leave the church. And I I mean I I I really trust him. I really do. I I, I trusted that he was telling me the truth, but it was such a surreal story that that weird part of you inside goes. Wow, did that really happen? I mean, I don't, I don't really don't question him, but it was so out there. I really thought, wow. You th wow, did that did that happen? This week, another guy, unrelated, two don't know each other. Another guy mentioned the same incident in detail. So it is with confidence that I tell you what I'm about to tell you, okay? Because this is too jacked up. So the reason they left the church was, apparently they held, a, they, they scheduled like a, a men's breakfast. And that's what churches will often do is they'll get together and it's called fellowship time. And it's time for everyone to get together and hang out. And they usually incorporate some Bible study and prayer time. All right, and this is, this is what they did. Well, this one was for the men. We're having a men's breakfast, I guess, is what it was. A men's gathering of some kind. I get them all together. I think there's like 50, 60 men in the room. And I think it includes teenage boys. All right. Now, I don't know who led. I don't know if it was the lead pastor or some other leader. I, I don't know any of those details. What happened, though, at this meeting was they spoke about the sin of lust. Now, the church is rarely as ham-handed as it is when it speaks about sexual matters, human sexuality, it has no idea what to do with homosexuality. It has, it has no idea, almost no idea what to do with teen, teen sexuality. Um, it's, it's a fearful, strange thing where they tell you in with one side, they say that it is something created by God that should be cherished between a husband and wife, consecrated in the, the covenant of marriage. But on the other side, 
many times in many cultures, they talk about it as if it is dirty. It should be swept under the rug. It's filthy. It's, 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 it's evil. They get these guys all together and they talk about lust and they talk about masturbation. And they say, you must avoid the sin of masturbation. It gets better. They tell them, choose someone in the room to be your masturbation buddy. It's not what you think. The person is not there to assist. <laughs> <laughs> which I don't think would qualify under that definition, but you chose an accountability partner. All right. Your masturbation buddy. So whenever for any reason you were tempted to, <laughs> how do you say it? To shake hands with the Bishop. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just, just anytime you feel the temptation, you see, a, a, you know, you're a guy and you see a beautiful woman on television or, or whatever. I don't know, whatever. You call up your buddy and they talk you down. Hey man, you, you need to be strong right now. The Bible says that you need to be of pure heart and lust is of the devil. And you don't want to open those kind of conduits into your life because sex is something that's designed to be a mix between a man and a woman. It's a covenant that's consecrated in holy marriage, which is designed by God and Jesus, man. You just, you know what? Let's go out and let's catch a movie or let's go get some pizza. Come on, just walk away, man. Just walk away. So apparently this person is supposed to <laughs> to act like a, 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 an AA sponsor, as someone in my chat room just said. Absolutely. And you're supposed to go in this room and you're supposed to go pick out a buddy, a masturbation buddy. As I understand it, according to both of these guys, a whole group of dudes, like 25 guys just got up and just walked out of the room and just left. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you just, I think it would, it would have to be so surreal <laughs> and you would have to be so surreal to hear somebody say that to you, you know, um, these guys just got up and said, bye, <laughs> I'm not interested. <laughs> this church is too jacked up for me. <laughs> uh, uh, masturbation is evil. 620, thank you so much for uh, waiting, and I'm sorry you had to endure that story. <laughs> Who's this? This is August. August, thanks for your patience. What do you have for me? Uh, I was just uh, calling for the, uh, the back masking. Yeah, oh yeah, backward masking, playing the albums backwards. Yeah, I grew up uh, in Church of Christ, and that was like a really huge deal. Like, anytime we'd have a uh, youth rally or anything like that, it was always... You know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and the back masking of rock and roll. And through all of that, all the preachers and stuff we had, you know, that would talk about the back masking and what they'd say and all that, all of them would talk about what they said and what they've heard, you know, from things being played backwards. But that whole time, not one demonstrated it. Well, and, and I'll tell you, you know, this is pop music, rock music uh, has always prided itself in being over-the-top, cutting-edge, and overtly sexual. I mean, it's just always, I mean, for decades, there's nothing new out there. What most of these guys that were freaked out and warning us about with backward masking didn't realize that the albums were actually sometimes more offensive when you played them the right direction, <laughs> you know? <laughs> You're like, you, you actually listen to the actual recorded lyrics, and you, that's when you get shocked, you know? But they, they were big on, like, all of these bands that were satanic. I mean, down to the Beach Boys. They well, told us that Beach Boys were satanic and that uh, Striker, do you remember them? Oh, you mean Striper, the Christian band? Yeah, yeah, Striper. Oh. To the point, they had a book out at the time that was, like, Bands of Satan or something like that. And my mother actually bought that book. And I was not allowed to listen to any bands that were mentioned in that book which included people like Buddy Holly and the Beach Boys and 
our parents came from the generation where Elvis was evil and, and they would, when they showed him on the Ed Sullivan show, they refused to, to, to shoot video of him below the waist because his gyrations were too offensive to the millions of slobs out in the viewing audience. It's just sad to see what freaked people out, but you're absolutely right. When it comes down to it, no one can really demonstrate any true evil. It's mostly just fear mongering. I call them fear pimps and they're everywhere. Thanks for the call. I appreciate it very much. Have a good one, Seth. Striper is a band that I'll probably talk more about if we ever do a show. I, I, I resist doing a show on contemporary Christian music because I don't know about, I mean, this is a global show. And so I don't know if people in Europe or, you know, if they're down in Australia, or it, 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 do you guys know anything about Petra or Michael W. Smith or, uh, or any of these, you know, Christian groups that would you care? Striper was one of them it, it, in the 80s. They came out and they were like the Christian metal band and it's spelled S T R Y P E R. They they were known as the Yellow and Black Attack and they wore these yellow and black spandex outfits and they had long jacked up 80s hair and makeup on and and Michael Sweet was the lead singer and and he had that, this really high voice like a dog whistle and he would come out and sing I mean, it's just you just hear the 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 windows ready to shatter whenever the album played. <laughs> I think they had a crossover hit on pop radio once. It was a song called Honestly. It's this little piano ballad. And Google it or YouTube it. Striper, S-T-R-Y-P-E-R, and the song Honestly. And you'll see this dude looking real serious. And he's like, honestly. You know, it's just really sad. And uh, we were warned about Christian rock, too. It wasn't just secular Worldly rock and roll. Oh, no. Anything with electricity. In fact, Brian sent me a message on that subject. He said, my first pastors taught us that any electric guitar and any electric instrument was evil. How does that work? You're in church. Somebody walks in with a conga, right? Acoustic something. And it's, oh, that's all right. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Praise him with the conga. <laughs> and then somebody walks in behind him and they're carrying a full, a full drum set. Oh, no, we ain't going to have no drums in this church. <laughs> somebody walks in with an acoustic guitar. Oh, praise, praise him with the acoustic guitar. Somebody's right behind him. He's got an electric guitar. Well, we're no electric guitars in this church. Now, that's really changed. Now, churches are so heavily marketed toward the pop culture, toward uh, mainstream audiences that now it's it's now they've got the full blown rock and roll show. They've got the electric everything. They've got awesome. Many of them have awesome bands. They've got full lighting and fog and, and multimedia, multi screens and stadium seating. And it's very concert esque when you go to church. It's all about marketing. Get you in the door and make you feel emotional, make you feel like you experience something really over the top. But trust me, every movement of uh, the lights, uh, every uh, dimming of the lights, every pause in the music, every tap of the cymbal, every strum of the guitar, everything is designed to manipulate the emotions. Uh, so that when you leave, you felt that you were touched. But it's really, unfortunately, there's nothing there of substance. Let's go to the phones again. 630, you're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? Hi, this is Ashley. What's going on? Well, I just wanted to tell a funny story about my theist aunt and the Harry Potter books. It kind of sounds like a book itself. Hit me. <laughs> so what she did is when I was little, I loved Harry Potter. So when the third book came out, she bought it for me and inscribed in the cover, you know, happy reading or something like that, and gave it to me for Christmas. So uh, I was dealing with panic attacks at the time. So in that book, there's like Dementors, which are a metaphor for depression. So that book was really important in helping me get over my panic attacks. So at Christmas a few years later, I pulled her aside and said, you know, this book was really awesome. I wanted to thank you. It really helped me get through a tough time. And she said, which book was that? I said, it was the third Harry Potter book. And she said, there is no way I would have gotten you something so evil, especially for a child. That's a horrible book. I would never do that. And I was like, well, I have the book. I can show, your, show you your name in it. And she just refused to believe it. The kicker of it is her daughter just had kids. So she just bought her grandson's the full seven book collection of Harry <laughs> Potter. And I asked her, I was like, I thought you thought this was the devil's book. She's like, how could a book ever be possessed by devils? Are you kidding me? I was like, you are just a psycho. 
Wow. We're insane. Do you remember, uh, there's a movie out with Robin Williams in it called Jumanji. Ever heard of it? Yeah. For those who haven't seen the film, there's a board game that apparently has some powers and you roll the dice and, and wild things happen, right? And it's all fantasy. It's totally harmless. You can argue the merits of whether it's a good film or not. But I had uh, someone warning their children about they refused to allow their children to see Jumanji in the theater or on video because it was emulating the Ouija board. And of course, I saw the film front to back and I didn't once think Ouija board. It's just a fantasy. Thanks for the call and thanks for waiting on me. I appreciate it very much. Thanks. Have a great night. I have time for one more. Area code 805. You are on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? Hi, this is Jasper. Jasper, what do you have for me today? All right. Well, you know, I'm not really that old. I'm, uh, you know, going to turn 18 soon. And I just have, you know, just even this newer, uh, you know, just even in the uh, early 2000s, you know, there was this card game called uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! And, you know, it was a, it was a harmless game. It just has, you know, little monsters, you know, kind of like what Pokemon is. And, you know, I was really young, and my parents made me burn them. It really affected me a lot, you know? So when they burn them, paint that picture. Do they they put them in a, in a box and take them out in the yard? Or, I mean, wh- what was that ritual like? Oh, well, you know, they made sure I watched, you know. I had a really big collection. You know, they had uh, they actually sponsored, you know, little competitions in nearby malls. And uh, I always told my parents, oh, you know, I'd like to go to one of these competitions until they really paid attention one day. And they said, oh, my goodness, you know, those are the devil's cards, you know. It's amazing how Satan can inhabit a tiny little, what are they, three by four little piece of paper and and use it to infect the minds, hearts, and actions of an entire culture of people. So do you play anything like that now? Uh, you know, honestly, after that, it, uh, I really never even got back into those things. It really affected me because uh, right now I'm pretty much the only atheist in my family. And uh, even today when it comes to, uh, you know, like you were saying, metal bands, uh, they have Christian metal bands. You know, the lyrics literally say, you know, get on your knees and pray. And uh, even things like that, you know, oh, no, that's Satan's music. It's it's a difficult web to get out of. I mean, when you're a kid, you're an impressionable child, and you're programmed to see evil and benign things everywhere you go it takes a while many many people still struggle even to this day irrationally and they know it's irrational and and yet when a certain song plays or or they see some sort of a pop culture icon they they get a little bit of a you know twitch in the eye and they freak out a little bit you know on the inside it's bizarre i'm glad you broke free go uh you know go do something evil would you <laughs> thanks. Right, thanks, for having me. thanks for the call i appreciate it very very much i don't know you know i, I understand a parent's desire to protect the child. But when did we look at the world around us and project our own fears onto everything else? You know, Pokemon, really? The purple Teletubby, really? Magic the Gathering, Dungeons and Dragons, playing albums backwards. I'm sorry, you could take the Mormon Tabernacle Choir on vinyl and play it backwards. And somewhere in there, the law of averages says you're going to hear something that sounds like... Is that the devil? Or is it coincidence? A weird jumble of nouns and consonants that happen to join together to to form a word that you interpreted subjectively as the devil. We fight this kind of thing all the time where people just project evil onto everything and everywhere. And I'm not saying we shouldn't have filters up. I'm not saying we shouldn't have have, uh, discernment and judgment as far as what we do and do not allow into our lives. But geez, Harry Potter? (laughs) Really? Are you kidding? Anyway, we may have to do another show on this down the pike. I've had way too many calls and emails, and unfortunately, way too many calls and emails I was not able to get into this show. But I thank you for listening, and I hope you have a wonderful week. Aaron Raw is my guest next Tuesday night, 6 o'clock Central, on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com